He gave so many girls problems with eating disorders and body dysmorphia. He told you to lose weight on your knees. Yeah, he he said I had knee fat and I, oh. I've never forgotten that. We've never actually talked about this. This is really interesting. On today's episode of Self Dom, I've got my good friend Shannon Lawson. We've been modelling together for over a decade. She is full of knowledge from how to get started into modelling, how to live abroad and deal with the loneliness that can come with it and how to build your social media following. This interview is super interesting inspiring whether you want to be a model or not I think you'll be able to take away a lot so enjoy the episode welcome back to self Dom beautiful humans I wanted to start the episode with a little reminder it would mean so much to me if you just went and clicked the follow button wrote a review it really helps my little pod grow so today's episode is a modeling 101 Today's guest is a huge inspiration to me. We have known each other for a very long time. We've done some super questionable runways together, but also some amazing overseas shoots. We really have done it all, me and this girl. I've always looked up to her, not just physically because she's six foot tall and so much taller than me, but because she is such a professional. Today's guest is Shannon Lawson a model, health and fitness advocate, digital personality, and a mum. Shannon has been modeling for over a decade and has shot all around the world for some of the world's biggest brands. And I feel so lucky to call her a friend of mine. Today, we are going to deep dive into the modeling industry, how to get started, challenges that will come up, how to handle rejection, and so much more. Shannon has been an amazing role model to me and so many others, so I cannot wait to pick her brain. So Shannon, welcome to Self Dom. Dom, that was an amazing intro. That was like, you know my resume better than I do (laughs) at this point. Well, you're an incredible human. I really could just give you compliment after compliment. And I thought there's no better person to get on the pod to talk about modeling. A lot of the Self Dom community ask questions about how to get into it, the impacts of social media on modeling. So Mm. I thought... We'll kind of both answer both questions and see how it rolls. Yeah, I feel like there's going to be a lot of feedback on my end because I feel like every question you could equally answer. So I'll be interested to see where this goes and how long we can talk for. Amazing. Well, I think for any listeners who don't know Shannon, I think it would be good just to start off and just share how you got into modelling and what was your story with it. I feel like you were there at the beginning with me. That's the the crazy part. Well, like when we met, you were like 16 and I think I was like 18 or something and yeah. um, We were... Were babies. Babies. Oh my <laughs> God. I know what. Ugh, and now we're so old. God. Um, <laughs> yeah. So with modeling, it was such an interesting take for me because I was supposed to be a dancer. So I went to performing arts school, danced my whole life up until I was like 18. And then I went to a casting for a runway show that had choreography in it. Oh. So I expected it to be more dance movement, but it was very much like you know, just straight runway. You just needed to know where to stand, basically. I mean, and you're a six foot goddess. Oh God, I, you sh- I've still got the photo from that casting, and it is tragic. Like I had my Maybelline makeup from the cosmetics store on my face, and I'm just cringing at it. But and no hate on Maybelline. Uh, no hate on Maybelline. <laughs> I mean, I would love to be plugged by them. I'll, I'll happily work with them. Um, but yeah, I look back at that day, and I did the casting hunched over not very proud of my body I don't know I was in a swimsuit and this um casting agent came over and was like oh like you're new to this I'd love you to come in for a meeting and I did that the week after um I didn't end up booking that runway show um so (laughs) that didn't really work out but I did meet the agent um that represented me for like two years um such a learning curve because it went nowhere (laughs) which agency was this oh I don't even remember his name his name was like Ramel or something like that. And he didn't really have an agency. He was also beginning. So, I mean, I really threw myself into that for two years and didn't go anywhere and had to just like learn a lot of hard lessons. Um, And yeah, I mean, through that though, then I, you know, met people on jobs and test shoots and, you know, had that hustle started. Um, And yeah, I kind of just, I don't know. I just felt like I took whatever images I had after two years and then went into a bunch of agencies and um, applied through open casting calls and eventually landed the next step, which was like, oh, I can't even remember what the agency was called. I think it was like was it Wink platform, or something. Yeah. Oh, Platform. Sorry. Because we were platform. there together, remember? With yeah. Gordon. With Gordon. He told me that I needed to lose weight on my ankles, under my on arms. My knees. He gave so many girls 
problems with eating disorders and body dysmorphia. He told you to lose weight on your knees. Yeah, he he said I had knee fat and I, oh. I've never forgotten that. We've never actually talked about this. This is yeah. really interesting. No, and I never forget it. He was like, you every time you wait at a stop sign, do calf raises because your ankles are too fat. Oh, my God. And I literally had is he still problems around? with eating. No. I think he might be still around. I hope not. I've seen the website. Me and Francesca Hong were talking about it because she's oh, she was also with oh, them. Oh, I know. I think everyone, even bookers, are ex-platform. I feel like it was such a stepping stone because, you know, Australia has such a small mm. market and one where you it's really hard to get into big agencies straight away so you need to go to the smaller ones to pivot. But um, so then, that was platform. It was. It really was. Um, and then a bunch of other agencies thereafter over the next decade. But um, that's how I got started. But how did you get into platform? Like what was your journey there? Um, I was scouted at Bondi, but I, I was scouted by platform when I was 14 doing a June Daly Watkins course. Did like you a, do one of those? Yeah, I did like an etiquette course, but not the modeling one. My mum put me through etiquette because I was a slob tomboy. Oh my God. And it literally taught you how to use your cutlery, walk down the stairs without yeah. flashing people. It was such a strange course. But I, they signed, they asked my parents to sign me and my parents said no because I was 14. And then I was in Bondi when I was 15 and this guy, Richard Manor, came up to me and he was like, have you ever considered modelling? And I was like, you know, the seed was kind of planted a few times. Mm. Like I remember being in LA when I was really young on a family holiday and people would come up to my mum and say, you know, your daughter should do modelling. So the seed was planted from a really young age. I also hit puberty super early so I was quite tall for my age and I'm not tall now wow (laughs) um so I looked older than I was yeah as well and so the guy at Bondi he was the creative director of Tony and Guy his brother was David Manor and they actually have journal magazine now like they're quite big deal Mm. did my first test shoot with them and then kind of got the ball rolling but yeah I used to leave school and do the morning shows with you oh we, the morning shows yeah, we, Dom I again you know my resume better than I yeah, do I actually do that's hectic yeah the morning shows in um at channel nine that's crazy yeah so I feel like we my kind of journey with it was quite organic and I think social media is what gave me longevity in my career totally. but we will definitely touch on that now but it sounds like for you as well you kind of fell into it and then you definitely had hustle and drive once you saw the opportunity oh and once you see the paychecks roll in and like they can be good uh it's slightly addictive and then you want more especially as well I think you are someone who loves traveling meeting new people like there's so many things the flexibility the flexibility yep. and I know for me, I worked a lot of retail jobs. As soon as I turned 14, nine months, I had jobs. So then yeah, once same. an opportunity came to me to do thing like modeling, which was actually fun and social instead of cutting, like I was cleaning hair in a um, salon Someone. or working at a juice bar. I was like, this is amazing. I remember walking into like mid city in the city and running into you that day while you're working retail. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, but this is it's just, like, there's so many flashbacks I'm having yeah. now as we talk through this. Yeah, we really have done we've known each other for a really long time so with that in mind I wanted to jump into questions that will help anyone out there who wants to get into modeling and I wanted to know your advice for someone who wants to get an agent but isn't sure how or is struggling to get signed what would you recommend they do yeah I guess now as a part-time model scout it is it's a bit of a process I, I do see how talent that approach us do it in ways that is successful and then there's some ways that aren't successful but I'll elaborate in a second I guess my my tip is the open casting calls I feel like most models translate better in person I feel like yeah you can send in photos but this is where most talent go wrong they send in photos of selfies or Mm. makeup and hair photos or like bikini photos and that's not what an agency wants to see they want you to set up a tripod get a friend put jeans and a singlet on be your rawest self which is also you know a very vulnerable thing for a new talent to do but um when I'm on the model scouting side I do see like Photoshop photos come through. It actually says in the file, airbrush, you know, number 73, face tune. And like, you don't understand that. Bookers are seeing that. That's their first point of contact. So I feel like there's so many errors made with digital submissions. So if you can do an online open cast, not online, uh, open casting call, um, I feel like you get a feel 
for the agency, you also are shopping around. You you kind of want to know um, if this is the right fit for you. But agencies do open up like twice a week where you can kind of go in and take really? some photos. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, they that's still awesome. do that. Um, so I think that's probably the easiest way to go in. Um, and then if you are doing the online submissions, just the hot tip to not submit Instagram photos, no. glamour photos, none of that. It has to be the most natural photos you can possibly take because you want them leave, you want to leave them wanting more. So they're going to ask you to come in. They want to see more of you because how can they manipulate your look and your hair? And anyways, like, I think that is my biggest tip. Um, and if, you know, you're rejected constantly by agencies, there are, online platforms like Star Now and Wink and The Right Fit where you can kind of just start pitching yourself for jobs that are available and hopefully in, in turn get some photos that you're kind of getting more proud of for a portfolio to take to agencies. That's like another side step into the industry. But um, I definitely recommend the open casting course. You just have to Google it. It's on most websites or you can call the agency, but it's a bit aggressive. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just look online. Well, I think those. that's amazing advice, especially now, as you said, you're doing scouting and and these things and what came to mind as well is in this world that we live in everyone's posting edited photos like there's so many filters and people think that that's when they look their best but I thought this would be a really nice moment to remind you that the modeling industry really celebrates diversity now it really celebrates your differences your flaws like something that you didn't like about yourself like my personally I never liked my nose and I've spoke about in a previous episode about self-love, how I went and got consults to get a nose job. And now I'm looking back and I'm so happy I didn't do it because I would have looked like everyone else and it would have been harder to get jobs when I look like everyone else. It's been one of my things that gets me other jobs because I look different. Yeah, you need a point of difference. If, yeah. if every blonde beach, Bondi beach girl you know, went to the same agency, like they're so like, they're going to be competitive with their own look. Like you need to stand out. You need to have a different nose, different eye shape, uh, jaw shape, you know, if, you need to stand Whatever out. It is. You are your own unique look. So and be I proud also of that. think like agencies want you as a blank canvas. And if you're driven and if they tell you, we want to cut your hair or do anything, you're a blank canvas ready for it. Mm. And I think showing yourself raw is such good feedback and it can feel really vulnerable as well to send photos that are unedited if you're used to editing, but we're giving you our advice. If you want it, you need to find that self love and confidence and just own it. And um, yeah, I think the open casting calls are good because then you don't need to like micromanage the images. You can just be yourself. And you know that you showed yourself rather yeah, than like your an true image. self. And that's also a way to handle rejection is like you know that you gave them your best, most natural self. You're not trying to fake it or dye your hair a certain colour or I don't know, put a load of makeup on and hide behind a facade. Like you are your natural self. So if, if you're getting rejected for that, don't take that as like the worst thing in the world. It's just not the right fit. Like it just doesn't yeah. doesn't make sense to that agency. So go find another one that does. Yeah, and that's also beautiful advice. It's like you're never not good enough, you just weren't the right fit. Yeah. So important to remember so I wanted to dive into how you learn to pose and walk like you have done a lot of runways and you're still doing them I know. so how how did you learn to pose and walk oh my god I, th- I think about this question so often because now I'm sort of mentoring young girls and my dance history allowed me to be a bit more organic with movement I find it very natural to move so my advice is always to have extra skills as a model and like go to acting classes go do dancing classes start to learn your body shape if you're super tall you might need to shrink yourself in a photo so how do you manipulate your body um so I definitely think movement is super important and you need to have variety in posing now if that isn't for you you can educate yourself you can go online you can look up, let's just say PE Nation. They're a sports like athleisure brand. They do really organic, fun shapes and poses. Go research those, screenshot them, have them in your phone. If that's sort of the category that you're in, start to mimic those poses. And it's not like you need to look into a mirror. It's like, we've got iPhones, stick an iPhone on a tripod, start to practice and and follow some shapes on the camera and watch it back. Because I think it's the best feedback is when you watch yourself back on camera, it's so intimidating. It's like this podcast. If I hear my voice later, I'm going to be like, oh my God, like what is that? But, Shannon um, never listens to the podcast. <laughs> oh no, it's just like it's the voice thing. Um, She's done. 
So I just think if you have the opportunity to just film yourself and practice and do your research, like modeling isn't as simple as just rocking up and taking a pretty photo. Like I like to research brands way ahead of the casting, way ahead of the job and then save stuff in my phone so that I can go hide in the change room and go, oh my God, there's three poses I haven't tried. I think this is going to be great for this look and then go out there, try something daring. And it usually does translate because you you feel confident that you've seen something and it works and you might not be able to mimic it, but like just getting on set and moving and just feeling a bit daring is it always translates. I feel like the most awkward poses are always the best poses. I know every photographer will say that to you on set. Don't worry if it's uncomfortable, it looks great. You're like, your abs are burning, like your feet's curled. Um, I love that advice. I also thought about the other day that we grew up in an era of like America's next top model and Australia's next top model. So I I would watch those shows and I would learn from those shows. That's so true, actually. And I also wanted to share a tip that I think big poses and stuff like that is so important. But even just like basic e-com poses, if you're a model probably doing e-com 80% of the time, just learning how to like have a soft face, show the garment in simple ways, like simple movements, not rigid posing. And yeah, just like Shannon said, like find your favorite website, screenshot those poses, big or large or small and modest and just choose your favorites. And then when you go to those castings, you've got You've kind of got a toolkit of like your poses. Yeah, and it will, it will grow go. over time, definitely. The more and more you do it. And like, as you mentioned, e com is the bread and butter of our industry now. And thank God, because longevity in this career means you've done a lot of e com, which means you've done a lot of posing and you can show up to so many different brands and just outlay your little choreographed, you know, step this way, look that way, tilt your head. And the softer, most natural poses do translate because it's commercial. It's the everyday shopping experience for most that are online and they want it to be approachable and relatable. They don't want these like massive ca- campaign poses. That's like a whole different category. But um, yeah, econ poses is, is definitely a dance. It's, yeah. Yeah. And you also need to know the product as a model. Like it's not as simple as like, again, rocking up and just trying on an outfit. You need to know where's the pocket, where's the logo? How do I accent the booty and the jeans? Is the jacket open enough? It, you need to also style yourself, make sure all the buttons are aligned. Like it's a lot more than just rocking up. And I also think it's really competitive. So as soon as you rock up to a casting, like the moment you get there, they're casting you. So how long do you take to change? Are you taking ages? Are you on your phone? Like simple things like this is so important. And I loved what you said about the pocket and the buttons. Once you put on an outfit for a casting, if there's a mirror or not, just look down and take a note of the different things that you could highlight with your hand, like holding the buttons, as you said, hand in the pocket, brands. Love that shit. Mm. <laughs> like when you know the garment. So that is an it's amazing. It's product knowledge. And you also need knowledge. to know how to have soft hands, which is so funny because like, yeah, you can do all that, but then you need to really soften your face, soften your hands. Not show you're overthinking. Like not you show you're thinking that about you're thinking. Yeah. I've actually trained girls where I've said, watch your video back. And their eyes are flicking all over the place because they're thinking, oh, I've got to move left and I've got to move right. And all oh, the photographer's over here, but the, the stylist is over there. Like they're overthinking their movement. So once it does, um, become autopilot it's that's where you make the big bucks and you're rebooking jobs and and just as a, with anything in life like you do get better over time so if you are rigid and awkward and you weren't a dancer in the past this doesn't mean it's not a career for you you just might have to spend just a practice. little bit more extra time yeah in the mirror and doing that mirror work um so I wanted to talk a bit about your time abroad you lived in London for quite a while yeah, from five memory. Years, yeah. Yeah, we went to Thailand and remember you you came over from London for yeah. the arc job. That was fun. That was super fun. So I wanted to talk about ways that you managed the emotions that came up, especially when you were so young. How did you deal with being alone abroad? Um, loaded question, thank you. Um <laughs> I have a bit of a funny childhood where I was raised by a single mother. So I grew up very quickly from 12 to 16. And as I turned 16, my mum had worked for Qantas for some time. So we got flight benefits. So I started traveling at 16. I worked at Grady Union. I'd get my tax return of two grand every year. And I would just you know, pinch uh, pinch pennies and go traveling quite often with my staff travel. And I usually do that by myself or meet a friend overseas. So it 
was exciting to me. It was never daunting. I think I have a bit of a resilience from my upbringing with a single mum and just, I don't know, just growing up so quickly. So when it came time for me to move overseas, it was very much my choice. And I also knew it was a career move to like go be international, get that on my resume, come home with it um, and present to agencies saying like, I've just worked in London for five years and it did work. Um, So... I don't have trouble being by myself. I really enjoy it, especially now being a mum. Like silence is golden for me. (laughs) Um, So travelling overseas was a big deal. And, and I, you know, I lived in um, a little bit of time in India and South Africa and that's where you have to be streetwise. Like it's really unsafe, especially as a vulnerable model female. Like day one in South Africa, I turned around and my phone was just coming out of my backpack and I saw this guy stealing it and my instinct was just to push him away, grab my phone and run. And I'm in the middle of the city. Like there's people everywhere and this happens all the time. But I just naturally have a bit of resilience and strength where I just do not take shit from anybody. Like, and I've had to have that way because, you know, not having a dad sort of in the picture for most of it, I've, I've just had to, you know, grow some balls yeah. basically. It's not for everyone travelling overseas and I can see why people have to return home after a three-month contract. Um, but I thrived in it. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I love that, Shannon. If you could give someone some advice who is, you know, about to do their first overseas stint, what would be some ways that you know, they could get through it a bit easier. Well, I think just also the fear of like, you know, you can come home. There's always an exit plan and there's always an agency overseas that are there to support and look after you. I mean, I would hope so. I think I think um, most agencies are m- more receptive and more hand-holding and, and like to develop and create um, talent through a career. So um, there is support and, and we've got phones now, which makes it easy. You can FaceTime friends, you can, you know, you can call your mum and your dad quite easily and and you know social media helps because you can I don't know reach out to people so easily and um I think it's just with phones things are much more accessible and just not to be afraid of any sort of adventure in life whatever it is just just know that if you need to go home at some point it's it's always going to be there and I kind of thought while you were speaking like that image of a guy digging for gold and the gold's right there and he turns back like it's five centimetres away from him and I feel if you have that image in your head when you're overseas, it's don't give up, just stick to it because that job or that meeting could literally be happening the next day and you decide to leave. So even though you could go home, I really encourage you to just stick it out and just see what happens and do test shoots and you might never like we're older now and you know you're obviously a mom and you know I've moved in I've got a I've got a dog so I'm basically a mom too and you know I can't just go away for three months so I look at people who have that opportunity I'm like make the most most of of it I agree you're gonna look back on your life and think I should have made the most of it your 20s are for you know for you and you can be absolutely selfish in those years like you can you can date freely you can travel freely you can move house as many times as you want because once you lock it down yeah you're not really going out as much or being as social as much um and it's just a different chapter in your life but um yeah very much like be selfish in your 20s absolutely so I wanted to talk a little bit about social media I feel like we could both agree it's given us a lot of longevity I know in our career and um even when you look at some of the top models, you know, Bella Hadid and Kendall and, I mean, Hayley, like they're all big on social media. It's, it's part of our industry. So I wanted to know what are some of your tips for someone who is trying to get more into the digital side of the industry? Ooh, um, find your lane and stick to it. Cute. I think if you're trying to do everything, beauty, fashion, fitness, oh, all the other categories, um, it's distracting. So if you can condense your lane, I think stick to it. You know, um, I like to also say with Instagram, you have four pillars. Like what are your four categories? Mine is mum, model, 
fitness and wellness and a bit of travel and that's what I stick to I don't like to add anything else to the mix and it just tells a nice story through it all but in terms of how I got into social media um it actually started probably with like Bali body that tanning oh, product and I may God. have just They're plugged it around. just then yes they right? still kill it I think I think they also started when Instagram started so the OGs. I geez I, I that's what I'm saying I bought the product I knew they were starting off um Instagram was a little bit different then where you could post a picture and get heaps of followers out of it. So like I the think... The good old days. I know, it was so easy. <laughs> now you got to fight for it. Um, <gasps> I think it's all about organic posting. So if you love certain um, brands that are in your category, go buy them, go represent them, show, showcase them on your Instagram and start creating relationships where, you know, I don't know, Shona Joy starts seeing you're wearing their dress at every wedding that you're attending. They're going to reach out and be like, oh my God, you're you love the brand. We would also love to work with you and you start relationships that way. Um, but also video content is incredible. I think that is the best part to, um, create a bit of a career in Instagram. I think you showcase your personality really well. Again, with modeling, you might show movement really well. If you're into beauty, you know, you're showing your skills. So I think, video is your strongest tool when it comes to Instagram and that then goes into TikTok where you can minimize all that content and make it raw. So yeah, get, get filming. And I also love that you said buy the product. I think that's amazing advice because I, for example, back in the day, like had bought products and then ended up being the model for that job mm. because they saw that I love the product. So they wanted to, first of all, they want to, an ambassador. Yeah, they want like an ambassador who genuinely likes the product, but then they see you in the product. So just how you said with Shona Joy, you might get some free dresses out of that, for example, or they might be like, it's almost an online casting. Mm. You're almost showing yourself in a whole variety of garments. And that, then they might book it. you. And I think especially if you're new to the industry and you're f- struggling to get signed, like what we were talking about at the start, this is a great way to build your platform and s- let brands see you without having an agency and you don't know what doors it could open. No, Instagram is your own brand. You get to create the message you want to send out and um, the accessibility to brands and letting them see you, it's it's your mini casting right there. Um, so if you're, if you're creating such a beautiful page or imagery or reels, you know, it's not going unnoticed. Like someone's going to pick up on that. And even if it hits the Explorer page and it just happens to be that one organic, organic video that goes super viral, like then you're going to get a bunch of girls following you and it's just feeding and turning the wheels and keeping the cogs going and yeah I think I think longevity um in our modeling careers has been aided by Instagram I definitely know when when it started to pivot for me and the numbers started to change and brands started to see me and I was like oh okay there's power behind this so yeah social media well I remember my first paid job I got 30 dollars from a protein brand I'm a protein ball brand. Oh my god! Now you're like adding zeros at I the end of like that. Thirty dollars, and I was like, oh my god! And I got free protein balls. So another other rem- reminder is: don't think you're gonna get to shooting with all these big brands on Instagram straight away. It starts small, and yeah. it is a snowball effect, and it will happen. And the trend and is the user generated content. Like that's mm. a huge category now, where you don't even have to show your face if you're just creating flat lays and beautiful images. Again, like brands will notice that and want to work with you. And like a little side note, which is a bit off the modeling topic, but I know a lot of the followers here are not models or have any intention on it. But I think it's in a if it's a great way, if you love taking photos and you're passionate, just as you said, you don't always need to show you in the content. And I think now it's a great way to make some extra income. And it's passive income, it's pocket money. Yeah, and 2024, life's expensive. <laughs> Inflation is high. Like oh. if there's a way that you can make a little bit of money and have a side hustle, go for it. I think if there's a little bit inside of you that wonders, what if I gave it a shot, the Instagram stuff? Because I think some people are shy to do it because they care of what people think. And if the only reason you're not posting photos is because you care about being judged by your friends and people around you, then stuff it. Mm, Give it a go. It's not for you then. It's like there's also the mental health aspect. If you don't thrive in that aspect, then just let it go. It's not for you. There's no pressure. Don't put the pressure on yourself. But it's so funny when you're talking about what you just said. I just kept hearing stay-at-home mum in my head because the amount of stay-at-home mums that message me and go, oh, I wish I had the flexibility of doing content and creating things at home. And I'm like, you actually can do that. You can. And it's a slow start, but... 
I think you grow more as a mum, but you've got a stronger message to send and people that actually want to translate from um, purchase to payment. Like I, I feel like there's a click through there. So um, I also yeah, feel like social media now, some of the biggest accounts aren't models, aren't this or that. They're just your everyday person who's funny, organic and just genuine. So genuine, the yeah. whole game has changed from when it was It's used not curation, to be. it's creation, you know. Love that. Put it on a T-shirt. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you a little bit about mindfulness because it wouldn't be a self-dom pod unless we talked about it. What are some of your daily rituals and habits that are non-negotiable for you? I feel like this is so anti-self-dom. Like I am a coffee addict now being a mom. Like I need a coffee every day. I got one in bed today and I was like, oh my God, like my day is made. If I could drink coffee and it didn't spike my cortisol how it does, I would drink it. I love the taste of it. So absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a little coffee ritual. It's like literally the core of every catch up as a mum. So coffee is definitely one of them. And I would also say wine, but uh, that's a PM drink. Um, My other ritual is like two or three workouts a week. And I don't say that for my physical sense. It's more my mental health. Like I need to be strong in my mind to give my daughter the best day she can have each day. So if I'm, you know not a happy mom, then that's going to translate. So for me, going to work out, having an hour away from my child to just dedicate to myself, even if it's a slow or a fast workout, it's building strength in my mental health and my body will follow and then the people around me are going to follow. So I really do need to move my body and that might not even be a workout. That could just be going out for an hour walk with my dog. But just stepping away from the house, your phone, your child, that is my biggest mindfulness like I love that and being present sounds yeah yeah. and I feel like with what you're all about you want to be the best role model to your to your daughter and I think that completely changes your perspective and how you see movement it's not about the physical anymore it's about I want to step up and be the best mum I can which is really special but in saying that you're a weapon in the gym even if you're only going two times a week, that's still amazing. We trained a few times in 2021 when you were prepping for Survivor. She was on Survivor and I could never do that. So I am so impressed. Oh, I think anyone can do it. I think I think it's such a life-changing moment to like rip everything away, go live in the, for me, the outback, but mostly in Samoa on the beach and um, also play a game. Like how many times do you get to play this awesome, like. I don't know if I could do it. Six week game. I couldn't sleep on the floor with people. That's true. You can't even share a bed. No, (laughs) exactly. I can't even share a bed. So, you know, I, all these reality shows are off the cards because of this. Not for you. But I wanted to ask, what's your favorite way to move your body to fill your vet? feel your best. Well, I love Yanis's workout. I, I love listening to your last podcast with him. Um, Yanis is super special because it's also therapy. He can talk to you while you're working out and it's just an offload of your mental capacity. And then with his workouts, I don't know, he just understands the female body really well. Like he even knows your cycle. If you're really in sync with Yanis and, and your cycle sync up, syncs up, he knows what mood you might be in and preps for that workout for you. So that's... Um, a huge Yanis win. So he's a great PT. Um, also he makes me competitive. Like when I work out and I'm counting down from 10 in an exercise, most people are trying to escape that 10 seconds. I'm actually living in the 10 seconds going, I'm getting stronger. I'm loving this burn. Like I want more of this. Like I can even maybe count an extra two seconds onto this and hold it. So for me, um, yeah, counting down in a workout isn't a loss. It's a win. So I really thrive in that. And when I work out, most trainers are like, oh, you've barely sweated. And I'm like, oh, look, I'm not really a sweaty person, but I actually enjoy the workout to the point that I'm actually smiling through a Pilates class. And like my face, my hands, my body's super relaxed because I only get those like one or two hours a week. So again, I just, I enjoy my workout so much and it never started that way, but I've gotten to a point where it's this escapism. Like I really love it. I love that. And I think a big thing I always am pushing with the self-dom community is getting into this flow state where you don't look at this training as a chore anymore. Yeah. It's like the highlight of your day. 
Totally. And you never regret a workout. And it's like, it's so hard as a mum to like roll out of bed and try and do it before your child wakes up at 6am. But you just never regret it. You feel better for it. Um, so yeah, I've seen you getting up quite early and doing your F45s and I stuff. I try. Yeah. So now as a mum, it's definitely a mix of Pilates and your, your corner store F45 with a bit of hit and um, cardio. So uh, yeah, I try and make the most of those sessions. Pilates for me is long lean body and it's a lot of core strength and now pelvic floor. And with my F45, it is also the schedule works for me because it is so commercial, the brand, but um, it allows you to kind of train at your own pace where you don't have like a PT gunning it every session. You get to kind of get in there and just take it day by day. So yeah, I love that. It's definitely a combination. I think that's a big thing to kind of advocate. It's like mix it up. You have to mix it up. Your body gets so stagnant with what you're doing. And your mind it becomes boring. Yeah. So I wanted to end the pod by asking you if you could give your younger self some advice, what would it be? I'm so terrified of this question. <laughs> oh my God, what a vulnerable question. Um, I have thought about this before and mine is so boring, but it's so important, guys. Like, Looking back at my childhood with my single mum, I started working at 16, I became self-employed at 18. I look back at that and I go, what is my my advice to my younger self? And it actually has to do with finance. It is learning that finance is such a life skill that we don't get taught in school. Like I wish there was like, yeah, you can learn business, but can you learn how to manage your own affairs and accounts? So for me, in COVID, I didn't know I had a hex debt until I logged into Centrelink and I saw my hex debt and I was like, what? I thought I paid this. Like I was, what, 28 and I've just learned I've had a hex debt. (laughs) I also found out that I was not paying any super for the last eight years. So my whole 20s, I've not paid super. I have a hex debt. This is like a pivotal moment in COVID where I'm breaking down going, oh my God, I can't work. I can't work. Yeah. So I, I look back and go, I would change so many things. Like I would want to know how to make super contributions. I now being an ABN for the last 15 years would want to know more about my tax and how to manage that. And now being a mum where if my husband died tomorrow, heaven forbid, touch wood, I would be a single mum, like my mum. And like we would be living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, you know, in my eyes. That's the way I grew up. So I would want to implement some more tools to be in a better position than I am. And I'm in a good one right now, but I could do so much more. And I've kind of wasted the last decade not preparing myself for that. So I don't know. I don't know how to install this onto others, but I think if you're just a bit more aware about your finances, especially being self-employed, I think it's so important when you get a mortgage, when you get a car, there's so many repayments, you need cash flow. How do you save for a holiday? That is like such a conversation in my head that keeps me busy. Like I don't need to be a millionaire, but I just want to be prepared for the what if moments because when you're self-employed, there's so many what if moments. What if we have another pandemic? What if I get hit by a car tomorrow? Like I'm not going to have my body, my looks all of that that career that I've just developed over 15 years, like I I fall off that. I think a lot of models have this th- have this thought process. Yeah, so that's like where my anxiety would be when it comes up. So my advice to my younger self is to, I don't know, just do more life skills when it comes to finance and be a bit more involved with my tax agent and just learn more with my finances and be more aware um, because – no one talks about it. It's not really dinner chat where you're sharing your income and you're not talking to your future husband over a dinner date talking about like, oh, how much super do you have? So it's just, yeah, being more aware of that. I really recommend if you resonated with what Shannon's saying, there's a podcast called She's on the Money and it gives really quick, simple tips on your tax or putting money in shares or becoming a business and things like that. It's really easy to understand. So if you're someone who is a bit anxious about money and that, this could be a good podcast. It's called She's thank on you. the Money. That's you, my homework for my it. car ride home. Yeah. So thank you so much, Shannon, for coming onto the pod. You I'm are so amazing. proud of you. Oh, you're so cute. I'm so proud. This is so exciting. I know. We're just at my home at the moment, but I'm manifesting all the big things. Um, I think the community is going to love all those 
pieces of advice, whether you're wanting to do modeling or not, I think there's some great tips in there. So thank you for letting me pick your brain. No, that's okay. And I'm super accessible. I love getting DMs from girls and and if I can help in any sort of way, I definitely try to respond. I'm actually really good at responding to people. It might take me a few days between messages, but I'm always happy to help. I'm, I'm very approachable. So Shannon's Instagram, in case you don't follow her, is Shannon underscore Lawson. And um, as she said, she'll reply to all the DMs. Yeah. So flood her. And I, oh yeah, also Shannon shares everything about being a mum, but also hot bikini pics. So, oh yeah. my God, I think I lose the mums when I do that. No! So. Oh. I'm like, woohoo. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you guys all for listening and I'll see you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.